Welcome back, it's Monday the 11th of May. Thank you for tuning in. Now, I want to do a bit of a report on the UK first of all. And the strategy in the new UK now is test, trace, isolate, this TTI strategy, which makes perfect sense. You test someone, if they're positive, you trace their contacts and you then isolate or quarantine their contacts. It makes perfect sense. It's what they did in South Korea from the beginning. It's what they did in Taiwan from the beginning. And even with limited testing, if you target your testing, you can still do that. This is why it's so important to target testing if testing is limited. Because what we've had in the UK for the past seven weeks now is this oppressive top-down strategy where everyone's isolated. Rather than just isolating the specific people that needed isolated. But the government's finally got round to realising this. Now, why has the government got round to realising this? Because the scientific advisers have now told them this is the rest, best thing to do. Whereas before, I heard the chief medical officer in February, I think it was, saying we don't need to test anymore. Um, at least that's my memory of it. Yeah. Uh, check check on, on, the, um, uh, on the original video. But he was saying that we don't, we, the, the disease is already out there. Why should we bother testing? I mean, how wrong can you be and, and how, how wrong can you be without accountability that it looks like that the medical advice from the chief medical officer and the chief scientific officer it looks to me like it's been wrong all this time and they've finally got onto the right track but there doesn't seem to be any accountability for that you just because th th this is a novel virus we know that but it's uh, not a novel pandemic we've had pandemics before I mean, this is how we uh, eradicated, or not we, uh, how the authorities at the time. In 1975, they eradicated uh, smallpox. That dreadful disease, smallpox, was eradicated from the world. This is how Ebola was controlled. Th th these things are established science. They're already known. So why weren't the scientific advisors telling the politicians this? Um, I think questions need to be asked, but they're simply not being asked. It it's all very strange to me. Anyway, let's go on to look at the, the UK. Now, now, globally, we know that the cases are increasing and the deaths are increasing. So this pandemic is increasing, but we are managing to keep it down in certain parts of the world. Uh, it's just a pity we've uh, gone on to the appropriate strategies late. Now, Boris Johnson, the prime minister yesterday, was saying that the reasonable uh, worst case scenario was uh, half a million deaths without the lockdown strategy. And I think that's true, but we only needed the lockdown strategy because we missed the opportunity for test, trace, isolate. But, but there you go, that's, a, that's water under the bridge now. So um, I think what we have been doing is correct, given the circumstances we were in. And a lot of people could have died. Now, we know that, say, half to 1.2% of people that get this illness uh, die but we also know that 4 or 5% become critically ill. And without the appropriate medical interventions, 4 or 5% of those would probably die. So that would have increased the case fatality rate from 1% to, say, 5%. And as well as that, if 10% need hospitalised, we don't know what proportion of those would die. So the deaths could have been even higher than that. And this is why I'm so concerned about poorer countries with less developed health facilities. You know, does this mean that the four or five percent that are critical are all going to die and we end up with a global case fatality rate in many countries of five percent? I'm afraid that's not impossible and it's very frightening. But let's carry on with the UK anyway for now. Um, nearly a quarter of a million confirmed cases. The real number is probably 10 times that. Um, deaths now uh, 32,000 essentially including hospitals and care homes. Now, this was upsetting. Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, said that in London alone, 29 bus drivers had died from COVID-19. So these are people that probably contracted the disease from the public while they were at work driving their buses. So that was uh, very, very sad to hear that. And... Um, as well as that, it highlights the problem with public transport, that with public transport, social distancing is very difficult. So the government is encouraging people to go to work in cars or preferably cycle. Now, we'll see that cycling has, has greatly increased in popularity in, in Europe because, of course, you're cycling in the fresh air or, or the same on a small motorbike or, or the same on an electric bike or an electric scooter. You're in the fresh air. So I really think the government needs to look at 
the legal position of electric bikes and electric scooters so people are free to use them because the law governing electric bikes in, in this country at the moment is so complicated and restrictive no one knows what well you can find out what you're allowed to do but it's quite restrictive that really needs sorted out because not everyone's got the physical fitness to cycle but everyone can go to work at least for the summer months on an electric bike so that really needs sorted out um because you're in the fresh air and you know you can, you can have a commute of several miles by by cycling that that's okay as long as we've got the infrastructure there which we're going to look at as well so public transport is is an unsolved problem at the moment um the risk of transmission on public transport and again Sadiq Sadiq Khan has appealed for everyone to wear face masks on public transport which I completely agree with um, now governments are giving authorities powers to close roads so the idea is that a council could close a road and say well this is just for cycles now because the reason bicycles are dangerous is not because they're dangerous it's because they hit cars or cars hit them that's why the main reason they're dangerous so if we can separate cars and bikes that would be brilliant um, now, the government's also introducing 14-day quarantine for international arrivals from the end of May. So, again, other countries did this at a really early stage, and, and air travel's way down now. Something like 98% reduction in, in passenger numbers. So, again, why is this being done so late it is a bit confusing. I mean, what, what, what the government advisers seem to have been saying, or the government advisers rather than the government, really, is that there's so much uh, COVID-19 already in the UK that a few more coming in don't seem to make any difference. Or are they saying that? I'm not quite sure what they're saying. Um, but, but they are saying quarantine for 14 days from the end of May, and that will be in a private dwelling. And presumably there'd be some sort of electronic surveillance of that, as there has been in other countries for quite some time now. Uh, now, the R naught in this country at the moment in the UK at the moment is between 0.5 and 0.9 and no one knows where it is now if it's uh, 0.9 that means that any easing in measures could well put the R0 at greater than 1 which means we get spread again so we don't know where it is so we don't know how much we've got to play with if it's 0.5 that means more people could go back to work and, and you'll keep the R0 below 1, but because we don't know where it is, it's rather a case of uh, let's see what happens. So um, the Prime Minister is saying that we need to uh, test, trace hundreds of thousands of, per day, hundreds of thousands of tests per day. Massive increase in testing. This will allow us to detect local flare-ups and to suppress local flare-ups with localised measures. This is what's happening in France now with red and green zones, so that people are, are uh, enjoying freedoms depending on the particular area, some areas more locked down than others to get rid of these clusters of areas, that, clusters of cases in areas, and that makes sense. So the government's got its five tests on how it's going to loosen things up. Five tests that should be met... And if these are met, then we can have ongoing uh, restrictions of the lockdown. So there must be sufficient capacity of the NHS to deal with the extra cases. Now, this is a tacit admission that there will be extra cases. But are they within the capacity of the NHS to, to deal with? Then, then that's OK. The government wants to see a sustained and constant fall in the daily death rate. Now, that is happening now. We are getting a reduction in the number of deaths but still more than would like, obviously. So that is met to some extent. Rate of infection decreasing to manageable levels. Manageable levels can kind of mean what you want. But the rate of infection is, is decreasing. It was, the R0 was about 2.6 to 3. Now it's 0.5 to 0.9. So that, that has, has happened. Uh, supply of tests and PPE can meet future demand. Testing we're working on, PPE is getting there. And uh, confident any adjustments would not risk a second peak that would overwhelm the health service. So these are the criteria that the government are using to decide how much opening up of society and the economy there can be. And what they've also done is introduced a COVID um, alert level. Now this goes from one which is low, disease no longer present in the UK, 
too moderate, that means there is some transmission. Substantial, so the disease is transmitting a lot. Severe means uh, community transmission and critical means uh, the disease is spreading rapidly and could potentially overwhelm the health service. So we can see that the lower this is, the more opening up there can be. So the idea, it seems to me, is this is going to be some sort of a sliding scale, <coughs> some sort of titration between these where, where when that goes down and these tests are met, then we can have more opening up, which does seem to make some sense. And the government's talking about a new working normal, new working normal. So separation by screens in uh, retail, for example. We're all going to have to get used to one way flow. You walk in one door and out of another door. Uh, aisles in supermarkets will need to have one way flow. So you can only go up and down an aisle. You can't go back and forward up the same aisle. Uh, things like no sharings of pens and no sharing of staplers and other office equipment. Cleaning keyboards, certainly in between users and ideally one user only having their own keyboard. And we need to go contactless. So be able to get in without contact with the door, be able to pay without handling money and uh, being able to switch the taps on. In American, that's faucets, I think. I think Water taps on and off without having to touch them. So thinking about various contactless things to, uh, to reduce spread in this new working normal. Um, now, I think we'll go on and look at Italy as well in this section. So uh, Italy, again, uh, great successes in Italy due to the very stringent lockdown. Again, it could have been largely avoided with very early test, trace, treat, isolate strategies. But of course, Italy is a bit of an exception because the virus wasn't known to be spreading until it was a bit late. So uh, now the, the death rate in Italy at 165, that sounds a lot, but I think that's the lowest it's been for weeks. Because of course, it has been many hundreds in a day. And likewise, cases down. So the daily increase in cases and deaths in Italy is much lower. In fact, we make a note of that here. Uh, lowest daily infection rate in two months. So that is excellent. So the infection rate in Italy is coming under control. But the measures have been stringent, very, very stringent. Now, this thing we talked about um, cycling rather than going in crowded public transport... So Rome has instigated, just the city of Rome has instigated 150 kilometres of extra cycle lanes by closing off traffic lanes and then made them join up. So real incentive there for people to cycle or electric bike to work in Italy, which is good. Now, Greece is interesting as well while we're on Europe. Uh, the cases and deaths in Greece are low. The Greek authorities acted early and have done a very good job. This is, this is remarkably encouraging. So the general lockdown is starting to ease now, as indeed is the pattern all over Europe. But concerningly, they're extending the lockdown of migrant camps up to the 21st of May. And the United Nations High Commission for Refugees says there's 120,000 asylum seekers in Greece in these camps living in very high density. And we looked before that the uh, population density in these camps is higher than it was on the Diamond Princess cruise ship. So if the infection gets into these areas, it is going to spread rapidly. That is a concern. And on five Greek Aegean islands, there's uh, 38,000 uh, migrants at the moment. Thankfully, as far as we know, there's no cases there as of just now. So that's um, that's encouraging. But again, because people are living in difficult camp like situations, if there are cases there, then the potential for spread is, is significant. Um, now, South Korea. We know the cases and deaths have been fairly constant now, but there's been 34 new cases linked to nightclubs in South Korea. Now, I believe that these nightclubs have now been closed down. Now, am I worried about this in terms of that resulting in a second wave in South Korea? 
the answer is no, I'm not. Because these cases have been tested. Their contacts have been traced and isolated. They've tested, traced and isolated. So they should be able to completely confine this cluster outbreak with these strategies. And I believe that this will not lead to ongoing community spread in South Korea because they can test, trace and isolate. And I believe that will vindicate the efficacy of this approach. Now, Spain, um, we know the large number of cases and the large number of deaths in Spain. Uh, numbers of people outside are increasing, so people are being eased in the lockdown. Most people are social distancing. Some people are returning to work. But most people are, are, are following the rules. The, the Spanish populace on the whole has been very disciplined. One customer at a time in shop and feet and hands disinfected when entering a shop. That's interesting. So hand sanitizers obviously should be obligatory entering shops, but here they're sanitizing feet as well by walking through some antiseptic mats. So that's good. And I've just got a picture here from Spain, actually. Um, quite, a, quite a nice picture. Um, so here we see in Spain, this is a bus in Madrid, I believe. So masks for anyone who hasn't got one freely available and seats blanked off to ensure social distancing on public transport. But of course, it's still indoors. Well, it's in the bus. So hopefully they'll be keeping the windows open and uh, hopefully a lot of people will be cycling as well. So that's uh, encouraging from Spain. As we said, so masks are handed out to commuters. Everyone's wearing masks, it's obligatory. And uh, the next phase of opening depends on the region. So a bit like France, it's depending on, on where people are. Some areas will open up sooner than other areas, which of course is might quite reasonable. Because as we saw the uh, South Koreans doing, uh, they are containing clusters. Now France, um, again, deaths on Saturday, another 80 deaths, but that's well down. 70 deaths on Sunday, so the the increase in death rate, these numbers are going down day on day in France, so, so that's good, as are the number of new cases. So that's the lowest daily death toll since the 17th of March. So again, we can see the effects of the lockdown strategy in France. Let's hope they're going to replace that now with effective test, treat, trace, isolate. So the lockdown is being lifted as of today, Monday. But the health ministry is saying the pandemic is still active and evolving. So it's not finished. It's, we're by no means finished. Uh, 36 less patients in intensive care, 45 less patients hospitalised in France. Not massive numbers, but the direction is good. So still 2,776 patients in intensive care, still 22,569 patients in hospital. And as we noticed, green and red areas. Paris is still a red area. So is going to experience more restrictions. Now, this was interesting. I'm not quite sure how relevant it is, but it does explain things. Now, for ages, we thought that the first French case was confirmed on the 24th of January. But then this doctor's gone back and looked at some of his old samples in Paris. And he found out a 43-year-old man who on the 27th of December in Paris had suspected pneumonia. When they've gone back to look at his samples, this turned out to be COVID-19 positive. So rather than the first case here being on the 24th of January, it was pretty well a month earlier, 27th of December. And this is the same for Spain and Italy, explaining why there was so much established community spread at an early stage. And I also believe that the community spread largely spread from Spain and Italy in the UK, um, that there was spread earlier than thought as well. But this is definite. So there was a diagnosed definite case now on uh, antigen testing that this chap in Paris was infected on the 27th of December. <coughs> and he had no known epidemiological links, 
but he might have been infected between the 14th and the 22nd of December. So this is putting it way back. And all they can think of is the patient's wife worked at a supermarket near Charles de Gaulle uh, Airport. So it looks like the infection could have come from his wife, but that's supposition, that's not known. Um, presumably they'll be doing an antibody test on his wife to try and establish that. So much earlier spread than we had thought in Europe. So the sort of conclusion from today really, um, ongoing spread in Europe, but at a much lower level, much lower level, much lower death rates, hasn't gone away. But according to the government's five tests, it's gone away enough for us to start lifting the lockdown restrictions. The question is, of course, what will happen as a result of lifting the lockdown restrictions? Well, the answer is the cases will go up, but hopefully they won't go up enough to contradict the government's five tests. One slightly concerning thing about the current strategy that's going on in Europe is in Germany, um, the number of cases are going up somewhat. So that's a bit concerning. So I think that's all we wanted to do today. It's an interesting situation and, and many lives uh, are, are still at risk. And we're going to have to carry on with this new normal for some time yet. Now, on a lighter note, let's look at some viewers' pictures. Lots of people sent me things in about cats. So this is, this is Alfie, who lives in London, who sent in a picture of his cat watching. <laughs> uh, this is Amy in Alaska, who is busy making masks, which is pretty wonderful. And this is Amy herself, sporting one of her masks and showing off her vitamin D. So uh, thank you for that, Amy, and thank you for this excellent work you're doing making masks. Very valuable work indeed. We need more masks in my country. Uh, this is Andy in Budapest. Budapest, the, the twin cities of Buda and Pest in Hungary. Quite a beautiful city. Now, this is Andrea and uh, Terra in Los Angeles and Boston. So these are mates, uh, friend, friends in the States, Andrea and Terra, and they watch together. Uh, and you can see them watching there on Zoom. So I thought that was really nice that they tune into uh, to the updates as friends, albeit in different parts of the country, but it means they can watch it at the same time. So that was quite a moving uh, picture, you two. Thank you. This is April, who's in Dallas, down there in Texas. Thank you for watching in Dallas. This is Claire in Huddersfield in the UK. Watching on a phony type thing. Thank you, Claire. That's great. Now, this is Dan in Nebraska, who's drinking a Corona, as we see. Pun definitely intended there, I think, Dan. But glad to, glad to see you watching in Nebraska. Looks like a nice rural area. Very nice. Beer looks quite tasty as well. This is Darren in New Jersey. Again with his vitamin D, which is encouraging. Uh, now, I don't know who this gentleman is. I apologise, I've forgotten to write you on, sir. But I'm glad you're watching anyway. And I'm glad to see you're sporting an appropriate face mask. This is Don watching from Seoul in South Korea, of course. Thanks for watching, Don. Don't run out of sweets, will you? Hope it's a shop. <laughs> Thanks for sending that in, Dan. That's good. Don, sorry, Don, not Dan. <coughs> Can't read my own writing, Don. And this is another Don in, in uh, North Carolina. This doggy bit seems to have been quite popular. I'll have to show him again sometime. So thank you for watching in uh, North Carolina. This is Duke in uh, Washington, watching in his Tesla electric car. Fancy a going one of those. But thanks for watching, Duke. This is Elaine in Kentucky. 
Thank you for watching, Elaine. This is Emma and John in Seattle, up in Washington State, isn't it? Good to know that a lot of people seem to watch over breakfast, and I'm glad to see yours is a very healthy looking one. Well done. I think there's some vitamin D there as well. I imagine you don't get too much sun in, in Seattle in wintertime because it's quite far north, isn't it? Uh, this is Eskil in Greece, pointing out that social distancing saves lives. Thank you for that encouraging message all the way from Greece and thank you for watching Eskil, whose name I've pronounced wrong, I do apologise. But thank you for watching anyway. This is Florentina, who watches in Romania. I like Romania. Did some work there with some district nurses once. Great country. Great people. So thank you, Florentina, for watching in Romania. This is the Fullerton family in Ohio. Not quite sure what they're doing, but they're clearly socialising as a family group, which, of course, is absolutely fine. So thank you, Fullerton family from Ohio. This is uh, Genevieve watching in uh, New Jersey. And uh, with Dog Daisy. So thank you for, thanks for watching in New Jersey. This is George from Chicago. I'm sure you don't get much uh, sun in Chicago either over winter. This is Gillian in, uh, I think that's Cornwall spelt wrong. Now, Gillian is amazing. She's watched every single one of my videos. That certainly deserves a prize, Gillian. So <laughs> thank you for faithfully watching all the videos. It's quite excellent. This is, uh, I'm not even going to, well, I should pronounce, try and pronounce it. No, I can't. <laughs> Guisi P in Holland. Anyway, thank you for watching. You know how to pronounce your name correctly. I apologise for my complete English ignorance of the Dutch language. But good to know you're watching in the Netherlands. Thank you. This is Glenn in New York. Thanks for watching in New York, Glenn. Appreciate the uh, the encouragement. This is Heather in British Columbia in Canada. So many of my viewers have excellent taste in art. <laughs> Thank you for watching, Heather. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, Hilal in Istanbul, over there in Turkey. Great to know people are watching in Turkey. These are Jennifer's feet, I assume, in the Netherlands. So good to know you're watching in the Netherlands. This is Jordan in Canada. I've got Dr. Etta on that one, look. So good to know you're watching in Canada. Looks like a bit of a studio there, much more sophisticated than mine as well, I may say. And this is Georgie watching in Brazil. You know, Brazil's one of the concerned countries. Uh, do say stay well uh, in Brazil, Georgie, please. This is Karen watching in Winnipeg in Canada. Thank you for watching, Karen. This is Catherine and Jenny watching in Cumbria, actually. Up in the cold, windy, wet north of England. This is Leah in Tennessee. Always good to have stateside viewers. Leslie in Spain. And uh, looks like bagpipes are at the ready. This is Lewis in Somerset, Southern England. <clears throat> well, yeah, it is southernish, isn't it? Well, everything's southern compared to where I am. Uh, Luigi and... Uh, Kater in Germany. Seem to have a lot of pictures today. 
Okay. This is Luigi and Katia, I think. Clearly getting some vitamin D from the sun. Thank you for watching. Marcelo and Valerie in California. Thank you for watching. Marco in Eastbourne in the south of the UK, on the south coast. This is Marek in the Czech Republic. Good to have viewers from Europe. This is Mary and Jasper the dog. Sorry, Mary, I don't know where you are living. Forgot to write it down. <coughs> but thank you for watching with your dog, of course, who, of course, happens to be black. And this is Matthew in Singapore. Oh, what a tour around the world, eh? Incredible. Quite amazing. Okay, thank you everyone for watching and thank you for tuning in, everyone.